Psalms 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that have made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth for all generations. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for letting us come out this morning, dear Father, to hear a word from you. Thank you for the families that are represented in this church this morning, dear Father. We have so many things to be thankful for. Christ that died on the cross for us to forgive us of our sins. Lord, we just thank you for so many things. Thank you for our pastor, Lord, that he will be bringing us the word. Bless his family, dear Father. Help those that are sick, bereaved, depressed, behind bars, and those that are traveling, Lord Jesus. Give them traveling grace that may, they may return to us safely. Then, Lord, be with our children, dear Father, in the schools, dear Father. It takes a village to raise a child. Help all of us, Lord, that we may give encouraging words, dear Father. Let, let us just give them a way that they know that you are the way, the truth, and the light. But dear Father, let us be there to help those that are in need. Lord, help our world leaders, Lord Jesus, that they will help the world to be a better place, show love in this world, Lord Jesus. That it's not, not all about them, Lord, but it's about the world and the people therein. Forgive us for our sins, for we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Tomorrow we celebrate Memorial Day, a day of remembrance for everyone who died serving in the U.S. military. Lord, be with those families. Dear Father, we just have so much to be thankful for. Let us be doers of the word and not just hearers. Not us just let us hide our word under a basket, dear Father, but let us spread the word to bring someone to you. What must I do to be saved? And we ask all these blessings in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Mount Enon. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. As you just heard, for the Lord is good, and his mercy endure forever. For the Lord is good, and his mercy endure forever. For the Lord is good, and his mercy endure forever. For the Lord is great, and greatly to be praised. Well, we know that we serve a great God. If we know that we serve an awesome God, if we know that we serve a holy God, if you know that you serve a God that woke you up this morning, that kept you in your right frame of mind, that put a hedge of protection around you, then you ought to give a great God a great praise on this morning. A great God, a great praise on this morning because truly he is worthy. Truly he deserves all the praise and all the glory. Let's give him a hallelujah. Let's go ahead and bless him right now. Forget about your troubles and go ahead and thank the awesome God that we serve. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Oh, I don't know about you, but I feel the spirit of the Lord in this house on this morning. So go ahead and bless him. Bless him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you can, please rise to your feet and join us in singing our congregational hymn, Because He Lives. Let's lift our voices. God sent His Son. God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. They called Him Jesus. He came. He came to die. Heal and forgive. Heal and forgive. He lived. 
did that. Thank you. 
church it's good to see all of you in the house of the Lord today this is the day that the Lord has made we ought to rejoice and be glad in it praise God I do want to acknowledge our guests and visitors who are worshiping with us today Lewis Johnson and uh, Sarita Lee are worshiping with us today I want to invite them to stand all other guests and visitors who are worshiping with us today, won't you just stand right where you are? All of our guests and visitors to all of you. Wow, look at all these visitors worshiping with us today. To all of you in the house of the Lord, we are so excited that the Lord led you to Mount Enon today. We want you to feel free to worship the Lord as the Lord leads you to worship him. We're a church that welcomes everyone, so whenever you're in our area, always feel free to worship with us here at Mount Enon Baptist Church. All of you who are standing, you are our VIPs for today's worship experience. Come on, Mount Enon, you know what to do. Come on, shake their hands, greet them. Welcome them in the house of the Lord today. Praise God. Now, now, I do not, I do not, what was I going to say? <clears throat> I do not, you can be seated visitors. I do not uh, typically acknowledge birthdays mm -hmm. but we have a birthday today that I have to acknowledge sister Rosa Rogers turns 100 today come on let's give God the glory Come on, isn't God good? Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Sister Rogers is in church every Sunday or as often as she can. Back here praising the Lord. Sister Rogers, you want to say something? I know you got, it's look like you got 
some family with you today. I know you always have a great testimony. Yes, I want to th thank God for being here. Ooh. Bless. Ooh, and bless each and every one that are in this building today. And I want you to know I love each and every one. Ooh. And I, I just feel so great to be loved. Oh, Mount Enon and Pastor Cope, I just feel loved. Oh, so God bless you, keep you, and just pray for me. And I'll do the same. Who do you have with you today? Do you have any guests with you today? Yes. Who do you have with you today? I have cousins, and I have my granddaughter and her husband, who's my, oh, um, they're my all in all. They, they take care of me, and so I have cousins and, and in-laws all, all down the line. <laughs> Well, I want you to know, Sister Rogers, you are an inspiration to us. We thank God for you. What's the key to making it to 100? What's the key to making it to 100? Y'all listen up now. Well, what's the key? Only God did it. <laughs> All right. Great. That is the key. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you, Sister Rock. Come on, let's thank God again. 100. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Sister Rogers. To Rogers. Happy birthday to you. Amen. 100. That's what 100 looks like. She looked like she got another 100 in her. Praise the Lord. Lord. 100. Glory to his name. Today, after this service, we will have an information session on the church's tuition assistance and scholarship. Uh, applications that's going to be after this service downstairs in room 120 all of the tuition assistance and scholarship applications are due June the 10th all of the men of the church in our community I want really want to encourage you to come out this Saturday at 11 a.m. for our men's uh, prayer brunch here at the church I want to have a good presence of men for our prayer brunch uh, we do a lot of eating I want to try to make sure we do uh, a lot of praying as well. So when all of the brothers, when you leave service today, I want you to sign up for our men's prayer brunch. We uh, have Pastor William Campbell from the Union Bethel AME Church uh, right behind us in Floral Park. On Floral Park, uh, gonna be, he's going to be preaching. And I want to encourage all of the men to come out. Our, our high school and college graduates come out this Friday night at 7 for our movie night. And uh, here at the church, is that Friday night? Amen. Movie night here at the church. And um, uh, so many things are happening here uh, in the house of the Lord. I do want to pause and thank the entire church, the officers, ministries, and members, and friends for all of your cards, prayers, letters, and gifts. For my anniversary on last Sunday, I am so touched and overwhelmed by your expressions of, of love. Amen. Oh, and next Sunday, next Sunday, we're having a prayer Sunday. It's going to be our service next Sunday. We, we did this some years ago for about two or three Sundays. We're just going to try to have a Sunday morning after we have communion. We're just going to pray. Amen. We're just going to have prayer. Amen. And uh, so I want you to become prepared next Sunday. 
to get into the presence of God for our prayer Sunday. Invite family, friends to be with you, us, in the house of the Lord next Sunday. These wonderful folks on the stage today are part of our Bod for God ministry opportunity program here at the church. Bod for God. We've been doing this for, I think, seven years now where we have invited uh, members of our church and our community to come together weekly in support and prayer for one another. Uh, they have lost over the course of that time over 3,000 pounds. And this year alone, this year alone, they have lost over 308 pounds this year. And uh, this team, this we have a team of folks, the winning team, Jacqueline Arnold, if I call your name, raise your hand, Anissa Parks, Richard Parks, Tiffany Redman, and Gloria Robinson, they lost 73 pounds. They are the winners. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Come on, come on, share. I want, I want you to get some, an explanation on this bod for God ministry opportunity. Share with us who these uh, wonderful folks are behind us and something about your ministry. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, church. My name is Tamara Johnson. I'm the assistant servant leader of the health and wellness ministry, and my husband, Lionel Johnson, is the servant leader. Really quick, just to give you a taste of what we do in this ministry, it's 10 weeks long. We are losing to live. We are losing to live by seeking God first in all things. Each week we weigh in, we memorize scripture, we have daily devotions, exercise demos, guest speakers. We learn how to eat healthy. We learn how to transform our lives from the inside out. We learn that sugar is the devil. <laughs> and we learn how to make that right. So we just thank God for this opportunity. Over this 10 weeks, Mr. Richard Parks was our winner. Raise your hand, Mr. Moore. Come forward. He lost almost 15 pounds, over 8% of his body fat <laughs> over the 10 weeks. And we just thank God for this opportunity and just want to have him say a few words and we'll be gone. Good morning. First of all, I want to just uh, thank Pastor Coates for being an advocate for health and wellness here at the church and encouraging us all to try to live healthier lives, spiritually as well as physically. Then I want to thank the uh, health and wellness ministry. You guys have been an inspiration to us all, and I just you know, can't give enough thanks to you all. Each week you come out to give us encouragement and you know, strengthening us you know, spiritually as well as physically to go forth with the days. Uh, real quickly, I did about 28 years in the military, and after leaving the military, I, I said, you know what, I'm done with all that exercise stuff. You know, I'm just going to put it away. And then something kind of pierced me in the spirit to say, you know what, you have a responsibility to take care of God's temple. And so I took that opportunity to get involved with the health and wellness ministry, and it's been a blessing for us. So I encourage any one of you that want to do a little bit better physically as well as spiritually, reach out to the health and wellness ministry and you'll be blessed. Come on, let's praise the Lord again. Thank you so much. Congratulations to all of you. Amen. We look forward to more testimonies. It's so awesome to hear the testimonies of the uh, members of our church who are being blessed in the area of their health. Others as a part of our Money Matters ministry. I hope we'll have folks in our Money Matters ministry on this stage who are getting the victory over debt and the credit cards as well praise god god is doing so much in this church and i'm so glad that you are a part of it well it's giving time church given it shall be given unto you good measure press down shaken together will the lord put into your lap god has given us this blessed privilege and opportunity to bring back unto him a portion of our increase won't you prepare your gifts let us give cheerfully sacrificially unto the lord scripture says that when we when we give we ought to begin with a tithe is one tenth of everything that the Lord has given unto us. The Bible says, set it aside that there might be resources in my house. And the Lord says, if you think you can't afford to give, the God says you can't afford not to give because watch me and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. For those of you who are worshiping with us online, we invite you to participate with us. And those of you who want a uh, text to give, you can take out your cell phone right now and text your giving to the number on the screen just put the amount in the body of the text if it's $20 just put in 20 
you don't need decimal points or dollar signs if it's 50 100 whatever the amount of your giving just put it in the body of the text you'll get a quick reply it takes about 90 seconds the first time you do it after that literally two seconds to give any time anywhere ushers permit worshipers to enter i want to encourage you that during this season when many uh, are beginning to travel and start to have summer vacations and go to family reunions i want to encourage you to remember your faithful stewardship uh, to the lord during that time and text to give is a, a wonderful way for you to be faithful to the lord let us bow our heads in prayer eternal and all wise god we thank and praise you for this day we thank you for this wonderful demonstration of your faithfulness that we have just witnessed today one of your daughters living to see 100 god we thank you for sister rogers we thank you for her life god we pray that you will continue to bless and keep her lord god we thank you for those who came on this stage today and testified about how they are losing to live for you god we thank you that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift god everything that we have it comes from and it belongs god you're a mighty good god you're a healer a deliverer a sustainer a provider god and for that we say thank you god you are jehovah jireh you're the lord our provider god we pray right now that you would multiply this seed that your will might be done on earth as it is in heaven god rebuke the devourer for our sake anything god that is sapping the blessings that you have given unto us excessive spending god uh, 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 uh credit cards uh, spending god uh, uh extra fees god whatever is sapping the blessings and the prosperity that you have for us god rebuke it right now in the name of jesus god we pray and decree that there would be no lack in this house open up the windows of heaven pour out blessings upon your people and god we say a special word of prayer for those who desire to give but had it not at this time god open up the windows of heaven open up a door right now provide prosperity promotion and increase right now in the name of jesus and god will be careful to give your name the praise we'll be sure to give you all of the glory it's in your mighty and matchless name that we pray in the name of jesus let all of god's people say amen amen our ushers are going to come our choir is going to sing let us give cheerfully unto the lord
You know, one of the things about Mount Enon is people, uh, people come here, they're excited to praise God. I mean, excited to praise the Lord. Someone was so excited this morning, they left their car running. If you have a white BMW in the back, your car is running. You want to make sure it doesn't run away. But I mean, that's what happens when people are excited to be in the house of the Lord. They just leave their car running. They just... <laughs> well, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon, chapter 8. And I want to read in your hearing verses 6 and 7. In your quiet moments, I want to encourage and invite you to read the entire uh, 6th and 7th. Six, uh, eighth chapter, rather, eighth chapter of the Song of Solomon. And I want to read verses six and seven of that eighth chapter in your hearing. And when you have that, please signify by saying amen. We okay? Amen. The word of the Lord reads as follows. It says, set me, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. Danny, can y'all pardon me? I, I messed my mic up, <laughs> fooling around with the car in the back that was running. Cool, we Gucci, good. All right, let's try that again. Song of Solomon, chapter 8. Y'all ready? <clears throat> Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is strong as death, passion fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, a raging flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If one offered for love all of the wealth of one's house, it would be utterly scorned. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. And I want to try to preach today with your help, but more importantly, with the Lord's permission from the title, How's Your Love Life? Is that all right? Help me to announce my title to your neighbor. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. oh neighbor, how's your love life? Okay, that neighbor's a bit stuck up, so let's try the, <laughs> let's try the other neighbor on the other side. Smile at him. Show him all your teeth, buck teeth, gap teeth, no teeth. Smile at him and say, neighbor, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. oh neighbor, pastor wants to know how is your love life? Come on, put your hands together. Give the Lord praise. While we laugh, the truth is that question generates some discomfort for many people because we assume that the person is asking us something that is deeply personal and of a private nature. We assume that the person is asking us to share or to rate the quality of our intimate relationships with one another. And the uneasiness we feel is because we presume the person is asking us something that is really none of their business. Deep down on the inside, the laughs, the laughs uh, is the thought, I dare he ask me about my love life. What unmitigated gall of someone to think that they can ask me about something that is so private and so personal. And the question we assume is by its very nature offensive because my love life is just between me and the person I'm with. But last weekend during the wedding ceremony of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, Bishop Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, 
here in America reminded those in attendance and hundreds of millions of people around the world that our love life is not just private in nature. He reminded us that our love life is more than about the intimate moments that we may share with another individual in the privacy of our homes. Instead, your love life is the measure of how it is that we treat the least, the lost, and the left out. And I recall listening to that homily. I, I recall sitting there speechless last Saturday, listening to this incredibly powerful, provocative, and prophetic proclamation to not just the couple, but to the world about the power of redemptive love. If you missed it, church, you, you might, you might want to look it up online, but that, in that homily, Bishop Curry emphasized the centrality and the necessity of love, not just love in the context of intimate relationships with a significant other, but, but love in the context of a deep caring up bond and concern for our fellow neighbor, for our, fellow, for our sisters and brothers, and for those who are part of the a human family. There is a strong need, a strong human need for love. The human brain is wired for love. The 19th century French novelist George Sand once wrote, quote, there is only one happiness in this life to love and to be loved, unquote. Love is so powerful, a, a human phenomenon that Jesus summed up the law and all of the prophets in two commands, love God and love each other. He told his disciples in John 13, a, a new command, I give you love one another as I have loved you, so also you must love one another. By this he said, everyone will know that you are my disciples if, you love one another. Oh, church, what a powerful proclamation that everyone will know that you are my disciples, not by your doctrine or your dress, not by your appearance or your attire, not by your worship style or your words, but if you can love one another. That puts the question, how is your love life? In an entirely different context, it invites us to consider how we would assess our love life on the basis of how we would extend the compassion and the kindness of God to others. Bishop Curry is right. We need more love in the world today and not just the kind of love that Anita and Luther and Peebo Bryson used to sing about back in the day but we need a love that sees the pain and the suffering in humanity and decides to do something about it and church there is a lot of pain and suffering in the world today amen while Wall Street once again is reaping heavy profits from an unfair money system and Congress just repealed regulations on the banks once again as it did this week. While all of that is happening, American households are struggling to make ends meet. There's a lot of pain and suffering in the world today. The president has created a climate over the past three years wherein many people feel it is okay for America to be racist again. Just this past Thursday, three Howard County High School students were arrested just days before graduation for spray painting an anti-Semitic and an anti-African American graffiti on school grounds. Just this week while I was in Denver in the airport, I spoke to a Spanish man who said that he and his partner were moving back to Spain, if not permanently, at least temporarily, because he felt that there was so much hatred and vitriol in the culture, in the government, and on the streets of America that he just could not take it anymore. The hatred is even coming up from the church. I received a call just this week from a man in Pennsylvania who said that he and his wife were traumatized the other Sunday after a visiting priest at 
that perished spewed all kinds of anti-gay and anti-minority rhetoric from the pulpit. They were so hurt and angry that they were considering leaving the church of Jesus Christ altogether. The writer of the Song of Solomon says uh, that love is an antidote for fear, for love is strong as death, passion fierce as the grave, its flashes are flashes of fire, a raging flame. Many waters cannot quench love, and neither can floods drown it. Love, church, is at the heart of the Song of Solomon, the song has been seen and regarded as one of the most complicated books in the Bible. And that is because of the church's inability to take a healthy stance on human sexuality. Nonetheless, the Song of Solomon, like most of the ancient Near Eastern literature, is a celebration of beauty, sex, and commitment. But it would be too narrow to reduce the focus of this book to love in its sensual and emotional expressions. The fact that the love letter is also extended to a collective, to a community is a powerful reminder. It is, a, it is powerful because it speaks to love in a manner that transcends the erotic feelings that people might feel towards one another. The transcendent power of love was captured by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he said, quote, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. It's with this in mind that I want to ask you again, how is your love life? Not well and how you are doing with your intimate partners. But how are you doing when it comes to showing compassion, the compassion, the, the God kind of love to those who are forgotten by society? How is your love life? That's what I want us to ponder today. How would you answer that question? Because truthfully, we need more love in the world today with all of this violence and fear and hatred, gridlock and fighting, hatred and fear becoming more and more commonplace in the, in the basic human conversation. We need more love today when animosity and antagonism are seen as strength. We need love to reveal their weakness. We watch as the love of power and wealth and status corrode our sense of decency and empathy. We need need love to revive our decency and our human spirit. When those in power seek to assert power and to subvert justice, we need to be reminded that love is what justice looks like in the public square. We need more love today. And so I ask you again, how is your love life? And as we ponder that question, Permit me, if you will, to give you some criteria for evaluating your response to that question. Is that all right? I want you to lend me your ears and allow me to give you some evaluative criteria for answering that question. Is that all right? The first thing I think this text is tailored to teach us is that love is not selective. Love is inclusive. Somebody say love is inclusive. Radical love, redemptive love is inclusive. And I want to contend that the message of the Song of Solomon is that exclusion is not love. In chapter 1 of verse, and verse 5 of the Song of Solomon, the bride tells us that she is black and beautiful. I know some of your translations say black but beautiful, but the Hebrew a conjunction there could be translated but or and. It depends on the eyes of the interpreter. She says, I want to contend I'm black and I'm beautiful, reminding us not only that the ancient people of the Bible were people of color, 
but also that all people ought to be included and not excluded from the tapestry and the fabric of humanity and should be included in our vision of love and that wedding ceremony of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle symbolized that radical inclusion uh, this fusion of the African and the European the black and the white the privileged and the oppressed were woven together in the liturgy the language the aesthetic and the substance of that ceremony the prince a man whose lineage speaks to one a power and privilege and Megan whose African blood comes from that of the oppressed a daughter of the colonized and a son of the colonizer showing that when it comes to matters of the heart love is love somebody say love is love they show us that bigotry and bias and hatred of all sorts have no place in the canon of love. Love is inclusive, church. It is not selective. That was the conclusion of the Supreme Court in 1967 that ruled in the Loving versus Virginia case that the anti-miscegenation laws which prevented blacks and whites from marrying were unconstitutional. The court unanimously held that laws that sought to prevent people from loving each other were in the court's minds quote odious to a free people unquote and were opposed to the constitution but more importantly the court was making the point that love is not exclusionary Jesus put it this way all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments love of God and love of your neighbor and neighbor church is an expansive term it is an inclusive term in John 21 Jesus tells people Peter that if he loves him to feed my sheep the possessive pronoun my there means that Peter is to love all of God's sheep not just white sheep and black sheep not just Baptist sheep and Muslim love all of God's sheep that invites us to understand that the power of love is broad the power of love is comprehensive that the power of love is inclusive. Oh, how we need a reminder of that kind of love in the world today. Activist and organizer Brittany Pacchietti, who is also a member of our church, made a powerful observation this week on Instagram. She observed that in the aftermath of the NFL players kneeling, not kneeling for the national anthem, that Donald Trump narrowly defined American patriotism in such a way that he declared that those who disagreed with him should be kicked out of the country. Well, Brittany observed that since Trump has spewed anti-American rhetoric that shows he doesn't like Muslims and immigrants and Muslims and LGBT people and women and the disabled, then maybe he is the one who should leave the country because we ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, we ain't going nowhere. Our country and our communities are for everybody. And the church is even for everybody. That's the good news of the gospel, that whosoever will, let him come, because God's love leaves no one out. Romans 13, 8 says, whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Yes, I believe that's good news, church, that no one is without the love of God because the ground at the foot of the cross is flat. It's level ground. It's not tangled so that some are higher than others. The ground at the foot of the cross is level ground. There's room at the cross for red and yellow, black and white, rich and poor, gay and straight, Republican and Democrat, disabled and able-bodied. All of us are included. I feel like preaching. 
at the cross. All of us are included, not just the holy and the saved and the righteous parts of us, but when Jesus shed his blood, he shed his blood for the unholy, the unredeemable, and the unworthy parts of us as well. God so loved the world. John 3.16 says that whosoever, somebody shout whosoever, tell your neighbor that includes you, married and unmarried. It doesn't matter. Whosoever believes in him should not perish but have ever. Sometimes we forget how big and broad whosoever is. Is there anybody here today who can thank God that you're included in whosoever? Woo. Ah, his love is included. Causes me to ask you again, how's your love life? Ask your neighbor again, how's your love life? Well, it is good when you can model Christ's love for everyone. Not just those who look like you and walk like you and dress like you and talk like you and share your party affiliation. The, your love life is good when you can love everybody. People who don't come from your country of origin, people who don't name God the way you name a God. Your life, your love life is good when you we can even love people when you don't even understand where they come from or what they do. God calls and challenges us to love everybody. By this they will know that you are my disciples if you can love. Woo one another not only church is love inclusive the text also reminds us that love must be put into action are y'all here today look at verses six and seven the writer declares love is strong as death passion fierce as the grave Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. Oh, church, don't miss this. This is a very powerful set of verses. The writer declares a love of action, a love of substance, strong and unquenchable and unquestionably powerful because love, church, get this, is an action word. It's a verb, not a noun. It may involve feelings, but love is not reducible to feelings. If I say I love you and do nothing, if you're being attacked, that nullifies and invalidates my claim that I love you because people don't know that you love them because you feel love. They know that you love them because you show love. Woo. The New York Times runs a Sunday column entitled Modern Love. And some time ago, they featured a story about a young woman raised in a highly religious community where young people were expected not to have sex until they were married. But midway during her teenage years, she realized, she decided, realized that she didn't believe in her religion any longer. In place of her old religious beliefs, she had adopted a new ideal to be a, a modern woman, powerful, independent, and sexually liberated. She writes, quote, I thought that once I was no longer a virgin, I would finally be free. I wanted to claim a new sense of identity, unquote. She didn't intend to fall in love. She wasn't looking for a relationship. She just didn't want to be a virgin anymore. So she went around and found a young man and told him that she wanted him to be her first. And after they were together, you know what I mean? <laughs> She felt a sense of freedom and liberation and empowerment. And in the video that accompanies the timepiece, she recalls feeling, quote, I'd done what I wanted to do, and now I could do anything I wanted, unquote. And she then asked the young man to promise that as her first sex partner, that he'd stay and be a part of her life. And he agreed. You know, everybody agrees on the front end. That they're gonna stick around. 
But when she tried to call him a few days later, it became clear to her that he was not interested in seeing her again. She was surprised at how rejected she felt. She thought that if she planned everything well, that if she gave him her body and her soul, that she'd be able to stay more emotionally in control. But the problem was is that she discovered too late that love is more than how you express yourself in the bedroom. But true love is based upon the actions. It is not just how one makes you feel when you are lying down horizontally, but it is expressed in how you care for the person when you are standing up vertically. How is your love life? How's your love life? Not, not just how is the intimacy you share, the pleasure you feel. Henri Nguyen, the Dutch Catholic priest and writer, Henri Nguyen said that each day we should ask ourselves the following questions, quote, did I love? Did I offer peace today? Did I bring a smile to someone's face? Did I say words of healing? Did I let go of my anger and resentment? Did I forgive? Did I love? These are the real questions he said. I must trust that the little bit of love that I sow now will bear many fruit here in this world and in the life to come, unquote. And scripture is replete with counsel instructing us on the substantive nature of love. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is is kind. Love is not envious or boastful. Love is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. First John 420 says those who say that they love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars for those who do not love their sister and brother whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Love it seems is more than a romantic feeling. It is not just confined to emotions and passions and pleasure. It's bigger than that. Tell your neighbor it's bigger than that. It's broader than that. Love is not just words in a love letter or a card on Valentine's Day. Love is more than chocolates and roses. The writer of the Song of Solomon declares love is strong as death, passion, fierce as the grave. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can fudge or drown it. Love has the power to heal church. Love has the power to forgive. Love is a seed of kindness that if you would just sow that seed and water that seed, then one one day it'll bear fruit. Have I got a witness here today? It'll be so much, there won't be room enough to receive it. Love is action. That's the point that I'm trying to get you to see. It's not just a feeling. Love is patient. It is kind. It never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love leaves the 99 and goes after the one. Love does not want what it cannot have. Love is not arrogant or rude or haughty. Love does not fry off the handle. Love does not keep score of sins and wrongs. Love takes place pleasure and the truth love trust God always always looks for the best and never looks back love is substance love is the nail scarred hands and feet of Jesus Christ love is a side that's been pierced with blood running down love is a crown is a head that can handle a crown of thorns on the head that's love love is an action to redeem a world that God wanted to bring back to himself love is an action church and we must ask ourselves can we love that kind of way do we have the kind of sacrificial love that will help us to love those when they have done us wrong. How do we love the stranger and those that we don't
don't know with that radical sacrifice and radical kind of love. Well, I think the only way we can do it is that we've got to connect with the source of love. God, church, is the source of love. Some versions of Solomon chapter 8, verse 6, read this way. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death, passion fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, a raging flame of the Lord. That shouted me. Because the scholarly debate on verse 6 provides some exegetical space for us to think about the power of God's love and God's role in the love he showed us. The phrase here in verse 6 is really one Hebrew word which loosely translates to God's flame. So the writer is saying that love in and of itself is a flame that has been kindled by God. This is akin to what the Johannine writer wrote in 1 John 4, 7 through 9, where he said, Beloved, let us, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every Everyone who loves is born of God and knows a God. He who does not love does not love God, for God is love. And in this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live Woo. through him, church. Jesus told his disciples in John 13, just as I have loved you, so you must love one another. The basis then on how we love one another is for us to get in touch with how God has loved us. And every single one of us has got to get in touch with what God has done for us. Our love for our spouses and children and neighbors and church members and strangers must be steep and rooted in God. God is the source of love for God is love. That is the essence and the meaning of God's redemptive plan through Christ on the cross. God did not send his son to die because he really sacrifices or because he enjoyed ceremony. No, God loved us so much that he stretched himself across time and space to intervene in human affairs, to reconcile us back into the world and to bring us back to God. You know why we can't shout right there? Because so many people develop amnesia once they get saved. They get in church, they put on a suit and tie, put on their Sunday go to meetings clothes and they forget where they used to be at this time on a Sunday morning. Many of you remember where you used to be at 10 47 on a Sunday morning. You were high, drunk, had a hangover, didn't know where you were. You ain't always been in church, but what did God do? He picked you up. He turned you around and place your feet on solid ground. Is there anybody here today who can testify when I just start thinking about the goodness of Jesus and all that the Lord has done for me? I just start shouting and thank God. God is the source of love. Push your neighbor and say, neighbor, God is the source of love. And once you get in touch with that, you'll be able to love the stranger and love your neighbor God's kind of way. When you get in touch with what God has done for you, Paul said in Romans 5, 8, God proved his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When you were out in the club, dropping it like it's hot, he shed his blood for you. Is there anybody here today who can thank God for the length and the breadth and the depth of God's love? All of us, all of us ought to be thankful for the love that God 
God showed us. God's love made us worth saving. God's love made us worth redeeming. The Bible says you'll be able to love one another when you get in touch with what God has done for you. Yes, Bishop Curry is right. Love is the way because love is what lifted us. Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can floods drown it. There's power in love. Wonder working power. Floods can't drown it. Just remember that. There's power in love. Racism can't drown it. Sexism can't extinguish it. Hatred can't kill it. Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can floods drown it. Oh, I know we are going through a lot today. We are seeing a lot on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And when you compare 2008 to 2000 and in 2016 to what we are enduring now, it seems as if we are going backward. But the devil is a liar. I want to tell someone here today that there'll be vindication on the other side. I know we're going through a lot, but love is the way. Push your neighbor, say neighbor, love is the way. Uh, have I got a witness here? We are here because of love. And if we want the world to be better, we need to reclaim the redemptive power of love. It changes lives and it'll change the world. And I know what I'm talking about because it changed me and it changed you. And if you don't believe me, stop and think what God has done in your life. Have I got a witness here? Oh, that is what... That is what James Rowe did when he wrote that great hymn, Love Lifted Me. I believe James Rowe was reflecting on what God had done for him when he wrote, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters he lifted me now safe am I he said love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me is there anybody here today who can testify my job didn't lift me my friends couldn't lift me my family couldn't lift me but love lifted me when nothing else could help love love lifted me and when we love no child will be left behind when we love no immigrant, no Muslim, no stranger will be mistreated. When we love, justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-rolling stream. Dr. King was right. We must discover the power of love, the redemptive power of love. And when we do that, that we will make this old world a new world for love is the only way. Can I ask you again? How is your love life? I'm talking about real love, as Mary J said. Something that set my heart, right? Real love. Does your love life influence the world to be better? Does your love life offer sympathy to those in sorrow and a helping hand to those in need? and hope to those in despair, and encouragement to those who are discouraged, and healing to those who are hurt. But when you get in touch with what God has done for you, you'll extend that kind of radical, inclusive, substantive kind of love that'll help make our world a better place. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord praise. <clears throat> the doors of the church are open. I want to invite someone in this house today who's not saved. 
Listen, if you're listening to me right now and you don't know that if I died tonight that I would go to heaven and spend eternity with God, I want to invite you today, my sister, my brother, make a decision today that will last the rest of your life. There might be someone else and you're here. And you've been saved. You're saved and you've been baptized. But you don't have a church home where you're growing where you're going. If that's you, I want to invite you to put your hand in God's hand. We would love to be your church. I would love to be your pastor. The writer of Ephesians chapter 3 wrote these words. I pray <clears throat> that as you are being rooted and grounded in love, that you may have the power to comprehend what is the breath, and the length and the height and the depth of the love of Christ. I extend to you that invitation today as we sing this great hymn of the church about how love lifts us. Let us stand all across the building. If there's one, step out of the aisles right now. Come on down today. Give us your hand and give God your heart. Is there one? Go say yes. Love, love with me. responsibility to go out into the world and do the work and our assignment this week is to show forth the radical love of Jesus Christ in a world filled with so much fear and hatred and darkness remember love is inclusive not exclusive it's easy to love those who are part of your circle, your clique, and your clan. But can you love those who are in another tribe? It's inclusive. Somebody say it's inclusive. And love is demonstrative. It is demonstrated. It's an action verb. It's not just how you feel. It's action. And you'll extend that kind of love when you get in touch really get in touch with what God has done for you. If you think you deserve to be here, then you won't love everybody. But when you get in touch with the fact that if it had not been for the Lord, you wouldn't be here today. You will love everybody. The pimp and the prostitute. The alcoholic and the drug addicted person. But for the grace of God, there go I. Brothers, I want you to sign up for this men's prayer brunch. It's going to be Saturday, next Saturday at 11 o'clock here at the church. It helps us to know how many people to prepare for. If you could go right on out to the uh, member services station, sign up for that. Let us know. Do we want people to sign up, right? Let us know you're coming or sign up online. Uh, Sister Rogers, God bless you. Got, woo, 100. 
Lord have mercy. She's the star of the show today. See y'all next Sunday. We celebrate the Lord's Supper and we're going to have prayer Sunday next week. Come ready to pray. Y'all be blessed and go in peace. We'll see you next time.